So we should start by putting the, the book as a whole in its historical context, and that's what the study guide tries to do a little bit. The book was written in 1920 uh, and published three years after the 1917's Great October Socialist Revolution in Russia. The goal of, of the book was to share the Bolshevik Party's uh, experience with the newly formed Communist International. Um, and we should say, you know, the Bolshevik Party uh, was historically known as the Bolshevik Party, but by 1920, they were already commonly known as the, the Communist Party, and then they became the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. In Russia, the revolution was uh, besieged at the time by invading imperialist powers, including Canada and the counter, and the counter revolutionary uh, white army. The Bolsheviks were forced to sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in 1918 with Germany in order to limit an invasion and end Russia's involvement in the great imperialist massacre of the First World War. This, tact, this concessionary tactic was attacked by leftist voices in Russia, both inside and outside the Bolshevik party. In contrast to these voices, Lenin called for theoretical firmness, but flexible tactics in order to lead the world's first socialist state. And you'll hear flexible tactics about a, a million times in this presentation and then in part two even more. Some of the political forces on the left internationally that united uh, with others to form the new communist parties were what Lenin defined as left-wing communist forces. And I just realized I should go to the next slide. Uh, so that includes in Canada, um, where you know groups anarcho-syndicalists, some some uh, some members of the IWW and one big union. Uh, back then were interested in the Communist Party and some became leading members of the Communist Party of Canada. And note that that uh, Lenin uses left wing in quotations because uh, he's talking about left wing uh, in appearance, but not in substance. Today, we usually refer to the followers of these um, mistakes or ideologies uh, of these kinds as leftist or ultra leftist. Um, <clears throat> and there is this note that I think is important in the study guide that leftist is used to describe individuals, mistakes, and ideas that lean towards left opportunism. Uh, whereas ultra leftism is a little bit more of a hard term, is used to describe more organized groups, such as uh, various Trotskyist, Maoist, anarchist tendencies, um, and ideologies that are more clearly um, anti communist. And I'm sure we'll get into some of that later on. So we can differentiate somewhat between leftist mistakes in our movement and organized ultra leftist um, forces or organizations. Lenin himself was mainly arguing against leftists inside the newly formed communist movement. Lenin's tactics, uh, Lenin's writings helped to build unity in the newly formed Communist Party of Canada around tactics such as our own participation in bourgeois elections, participation in social democratic and reactionary trade unions. And Lenin helped to clarify our approach to compromises, retreats and alliances and actually um, I think it was this book that was serialized in the BC Federation of Labor's um, uh, a newspaper or publications at the time. And it was, you know, even beyond our party, it had an impact in Canada. Next slide. Why is it necessary to defeat leftism today? Or at least talk about it tonight. Uh, the material basis for petty bourgeois radicalism, and we'll get into that big word, uh, and ultra leftism was not eliminated with the publication of Lenin's pamphlet. And these ideologies and tendencies continue to create problem, problems on the left and in our own movement. There are still those that substitute their subjective desire for revolution for a clear headed analysis of the objective conditions and an appraisal of the balance of class forces. We live in a revolutionary era in regard to the big picture, but Canada is not currently in a revolutionary moment. Lenin explains that a revolutionary crisis is required for a vanguard party to lead masses of the working class and more broadly the working people to power and begin a socialist transformation of society. In such non-revolutionary times as in Canada, some are fooled into believing that capitalism is here to stay and they adopt a reformist orientation to struggle. Some are also bought off by the capitalist class and introduce elements of bourgeois ideology to the working class. It is this right opportunism that is the main enemy within the working class movement. While helping to create its left, less prevalent but still dangerous cousin, left opportunism, which is our focus on uh, tonight, although it's not the main enemy. Social democracy, 
through its failings, which become apparent to some, leads to a relatively smaller number of those on the broader left towards dismissing all alliances in general, seeing struggles for reforms as a distraction, and closing themselves off in a small bubbles of revolutionary purity. The justifiable feeling of horror at capitalism's crimes can lead to some can lead some to a counterproductive revolutionary impatience and subjectivity. They adopt phrase mongering and idealism since it is easier than getting their hands dirty and struggle and working with political forces that disagree with them. Soon it is forgotten that revolutions are made by masses of working people and oppressed peoples and they substitute left opportunist strategies that rely narrowly on particular oppressed group in isolation or a small number of the reddest revolutionaries. For these tendencies, unity is, is, is not seen as a necessary uh, uh, step or thing to be built. As increasing numbers of people turn towards socialism and start asking questions about the most effective path towards socialism, it's absolutely necessary that we update our application of Leninist strategies and tactics to the Canadian context. So, um, you know, this is uh, one educational session, but I'm hoping this is a a small piece of the puzzle here that we can have some discussion that uh, helps uh, clarify things. Next slide. So the need for discipline. Um, this is based on the, the second chapter in the book, I think. Um, yeah, which is called an essential condition of the Bolshevik success. And for Lenin, the essential condition is discipline. Uh, Lenin writes passionately about the strength of the imperialist reaction and the absolute necessity for the dictatorship of the proletariat, um, a determined and most ruthless war, in his words, waged by the working class against the bourgeoisie. He goes on to say, victory over the bourgeoisie is impossible without a long, stubborn, and desperate life and death struggle, which calls for tenacity, discipline, and a single inflexible will. Lenin goes into detail about the process of building discipline, and the importance of a correct revolutionary theory as a precondition for discipline. The first questions to arise are, um, how is the discipline of the proletariat's revolutionary party maintained? How is it tested? How is it reinforced? Do I have this somewhere? Let me see, I think. It... Oh no. Sorry, I'm just, uh, I need to check to see if anybody is waiting in the waiting room. I just saw Liz was, unfortunately we have a waiting room. And I think I might be the only person that can let them in. Okay. Okay, sorry about that, Liz. I don't, I don't know if you were there long, but uh, we're, we're just underway here. Oh, okay. Good. I'm sorry, I'm late, comments. Oh, no problem. Okay, so um, where were we? The first questions to arise are, how is the dis disciplined of the proletariat's revolutionary party maintained? How is it tested? How is it reinforced? This is Lenin, by the way, not me. I thought about doing like a Russian accent when I was quoting Lenin, but uh, I didn't think I could pull it off. <laughs> First, by the class consciousness of the proletarian vanguard and by its devotion, uh, devotion to the revolution, by its tenacity, self-sacrifice and heroes, heroism. Second, by its ability to link up and maintain the closest contact and if you wish merge, in certain measure with the broadest masses of working people. Third, by the correctness of the political leadership exercised by this vanguard, by the correctness of its political strategy and tactics, provided the broad masses have seen from their own experience that they are correct. Without these conditions, all attempts to establish discipline inevitably fall flat and end up in phrase mongering and clowning. On the other hand, these conditions cannot emerge at once. They are created only by prolonged effort and hard-won experience, hard experience. Their creation is facilitated by a correct revolutionary theory, which in its turn is not a dogma, but assumes final shape only in closing connection with the practical activity of a truly mass and truly revolutionary mo movement. So what's Lenin talking about here? Uh, Lenin is talking here about the need for a vanguard party to earn their leadership. It is not enough to declare yourself a vanguard but the broad masses need to have seen from their own experience, in his words, that the vanguard's political strategy and tactics are correct. Lenin goes on to describe what allows, uh, allowed the Bolsheviks to earn their place as a revolutionary vanguard in the working class in Russia. Perhaps we can think of uh, ultra-left groups today that 
more or less sit on the sidelines and declare themselves the vanguard. And uh, we can talk about what that might look like uh, with examples in the discussion period. Uh, Russia came to Marxism through its own brutal process of struggle against czarism in the, uh, in the 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, Lenin then focuses on the practical application of scientific socialism, which gave rise to a wealth of rich experience. Because of the dynamic, rapidly changing nature of the struggle against czarism in the early part of the 20th century, the Bolsheviks came to realize the importance of a flexible approach to tactics. It is this experience that Lenin sees as, a, as vital to pass on to the rest of the world so that mistakes can be avoided. Lenin details this experience more in chapter three, which is called the principal stages of history, uh, the history of Bolshevism. And that in the study guide is mainly reflected in the section on the roots of ultra leftism. Um, and this is a pretty dense uh, section. There's a lot going on here um, and it's pretty um, broad theoretically. So uh, we're gonna pause after this for the first round of discussion. As Marxists, we know that ideas do not fall from the sky. I think Mao said something like that. Uh, this holds true for ideas that are both helpful or harmful to our revolutionary movement. If we are identifying ultra leftism as a set of ideas that are necessary to challenge and defeat, we need to take a deep dive into where these ideas come from and how they interact with other ideologies. Lenin begins chapter four, uh, the struggle against which enemies uh, within the working class movement help Bolshevism develop, gain strength and become steel. That's a really long uh, chapter title, by the way, but anyways. Um, and he talks about uh, some of these important questions in that chapter. He does not begin by attacking leftism or ultra leftists, but by exposing Bolshevism's principal enemy within the working class movement, which is right opportunism. Uh, he highlights the betrayal of the social democratic leadership of the Second International, inciting with the capitalist classes of their own countries in World War I. He then moves on to addressing ultra leftism, which is described, which he describes as petty bourgeois revolutionism. And this is the quote, well, part of this quote that I'm gonna read is up on the screen, part of it's not. It was, however, different with Bolshevism's other enemy within the working class movement. Little is known in other countries of the fact that Bolshevism took shape, developed and became steeled in the long years of struggle against petty bourgeois revolutionism, which smacks of anarchism or borrows something from the latter and in all essential matters does not measure up to the conditions and requirements of consistently proletarian class struggle. Marxist theory has established and the experience of all European revolutions and revolutionary movements has fully confirmed that the petty proprietor, the small master, uh, social type existing on a very extensive and even mass scale in many European countries who under capitalism always suffer oppression and frequently a most acute and rapid deterioration in his own, uh, in his condition of, of life and even ruin, easily goes to revolutionary extremes, but is incapable of perseverance, organization, discipline, and steadfastness. A petty bourgeois driven to the frenzy by the horrors of capitalism in a social, is a social phenomenon, which like anarchism is characteristic of all the capitalist countries. The instability of such revolutionism, its barrenness and its tendency to turn rapidly into submission, apathy, phantasms, and even frenzied infatuation with one bourgeois fad or another, all this is common knowledge. However, a theoretical or abstract recognition of these truths does not at all rid revolutionary parties of old errors, which always crop up at unexpected occasions in somewhat new forms, in a hitherto unfamiliar garb or surroundings, in an unusual, or more or less unusual situation. So I don't know about you, but I, I love that quote because you can, I can, uh, the characteristics about, uh, you know, the frenzied, uh, the kind of revolutionary gesticulations and stuff of petty bourgeois revolutionism, you can see that a lot, uh, even on the left in Canada today. Here, Lenin points to the material basis for anarchism and any other brands of ultra leftist ideology. Petty bourgeois is not used as an insult here, although you know some people on the left throw it around like it's uh, a, like a moral, a moral argument or an insult. But points, uh, but petty bourgeois points to the fact that the basis of the these ideas 
often come from non-working class sections of the people that are oppressed by capitalism. The petty bourgeois class was once defined as mainly peasants, shopkeepers, and artisans. What united these groups was their relationship to the means of production. They owned their own small scale production, but still had to work as opposed to the capitalist class or the big bourgeoisie, which uh, owns their own production, but does not have to work. If they exploited other workers, they still had to work alongside them. In Canada, there is still a shrinking tradition of petty bourgeois, uh, of, there is still a shrinking traditional petty bourgeoisie made up of small scale farmers, small business owners. Um, however, these days the petty bourgeois can include other elements of the middle strata in quotation marks, such as doctors, lawyers, as well as some self-employed contractors and intellectuals. Although the line between working class and petty bourgeoisie is blurred uh, through the corporate practices of contracting out and the rise of the gig economy, which is also bound to have an effect on class consciousness and struggle in the working class movement. Although that's like a more theoretical abstract um, uh, well, I guess it's it's an interesting uh, thing to think about, but uh, that's not in the study guide or in left wing communism. So if we want to talk about that, that that's uh, would be interesting. In addition to a tendency towards di undisciplined revolutionary gesticulation, petty bourgeois revolutionism also expresses itself as individualism, an inability to work collectively, accept party discipline and abide by the principles of democratic centralism. This can be attributed to the fact that petty, the petty bourgeoisie as a class have individualized relationship with the means of production. This is contrasted with the working class whose relationship to production instills discipline and also instills the need for unity and organization. We should say here that, that not all people from the petty bourgeoisie, petty bourgeois backgrounds are advocates of leftist positions. In fact, the petty bourgeoisie can also be very reactionary in some circumstances. Uh, for example, I think a lot of the anti-mask movement is made up of petty bourgeois elements these days in Canada. But also the petty bourgeoisie is not, uh, is, is only the material base for these ideas to circulate and compete with others' ideas in a dynamic way. Um, so we need to be also clear that obviously there's, there's petty bourgeois, people from petty bourgeois backgrounds, uh, definitely that are um, our comrades and uh, our, uh, our communists too, you know, it's just, uh, you know, we're not, we're not talking about moral class categories, we're talking about big ideas and how they're, where they, where they, where they, where they originally kind of have their roots, um, and then they get out there and circulate um, in the world. And there is a battle of idea, you know, a, a battle of ideas that goes on. It is clear that petty bourgeois radicalism of various stripes continues to have a base among uh, intellectuals and students in academic circles. Various separatist forms of petty bourgeois radicalism are most often found amongst intellectuals, professionals, and small business owners that are from oppressed nations and social groups. For example, um, separatism in, in radical feminist and black nationalist schools of thought, for example, especially, you know, in the um, maybe 60s and 70s or, or the new left itself uh, in the 1960s, which believed that, uh, or at least large chunks of it believed that the youth and student movement would be the main revolutionary social group instead of the working class as understood by those with a more scientific socialist outlook. In each of these examples, uh, the revolutionary role of the working class is, is substituted for a cross-class democratic movement. Uh, these days, there are many ideas circulating that promote uh, that a certain social group is the most oppressed and therefore the most revolutionary. That's a little simplistic. Um, while it is important to build solidarity and unity between all oppressed groups uh, by capitalism, uh, it is often a leftist mistake to rank oppressions as if they're in contradiction or competition with each other. Communists need to struggle against all forms of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ageism, ableism, all forms of oppression, while connecting these struggles with, to the underlying problem, capitalism. This is the mode of production that, that perpetuates uh, these, these uh, modes of oppression with, you know, in the, in the forms that they are today, whether or not they originated under oppression. Some did, some didn't, uh, under capitalism. In this sense, we should seek to build a convergence of struggles 
with the class struggle at the core of our work while understanding the need to connect the class struggle to the struggle against racism and patriarchy. Class unity cannot be built without fighting oppression, but oppression can't be defeated without the class unity necessary to defeat capitalism. Class unity, not separatism, is the communist strategy. And I'm sure there's a lot to unpack there. Obviously, oppression and uh, its relationship to exploitation. This is a huge discussion on the left now and historically too. Although, yeah, people think that the discussion just started a couple of years ago, but it's been going on for a long time. It may be possible to work with uh, proponents of this or that ultra leftist position in different struggles where unity can be found, but it is a serious mistake to adopt their ideology on the basis of it sounding the most radical. And I think that's an important point. We're not looking for um, you know, the most radical sounding ideology doesn't get you to socialism the fastest. That's uh, a little simple-minded. Lenin also makes a keen observation that left and right opportunism, which are seemingly at odds, actually have a symbiotic relationship. Uh, he writes that ultra leftism or anarchism was not infrequently a kind of penalty for the opportunist sins of the working class movement. The two monstrosities com uh, complemented each other. Ultra leftism is helped along by reformist strategies of class collaboration, such as a narrow focus on electoralism or an emphasis on lobbying and fear of mass mobilization. See that a lot in Canada. Uh, Ultra-left ideas are often a knee-jerk reaction to right opportunism. It is the role of communists to advance strategies for mass action and defeat right opportunism, which will undercut much of the ground from ultra-leftism being attractive to people. Lenin also touches on the important mistake that is common to many ultra-left groups today when he is arguing against the Russian anarchist-oriented Socialist Revolutionary Party, he says that that party considered itself particularly revolutionary because of its recognition of individual terrorism uh, or assassinations, uh, something, something that Lenin's own brother was involved in, by the way, uh, which he was executed for. Um, so while left-wing terrorism is much less of a problem in North America at, at this moment, as opposed to right-wing terror, although the FLQ is an example in Canadian history, there are still many people uh, on the broad left that confuse tactics and strategies with goals. These ultra leftist mistakes label some tactics as inherently revolutionary, divorced, oops, I think I missed a slide there, oops. Uh, so yeah, so, you know, these people think that some tactics are inherently revolutionary, divorced from the broader strategy of their goals. For example, some anarchists believe that all protest tactics against any authority are inherently progressive. Therefore, violence in Hong Kong or Syria is to be supported regardless of the political goals of these forces. It doesn't matter what they're fighting for. If they're burning police cars, awesome. Other examples of mistakes of this nature include fetishization of certain tactics, especially direct action, uh, like putting a lot of stock in stopping traffic as an economic disruption when, for example, construction workers frequently stop traffic and there's nothing revolutionary about that. In general, communists should support tactics, including direct actions that are oriented towards building mass action. In some circumstances, small scale actions involving civil disobedience can galvanize mass action. In other contexts, small scale actions can discourage mass action by alienating potential allies or some small actions opportunistically um, being promoted because they ignore because they're afraid or don't want to go through the effort of, of actually organizing mass action. Lenin continually emphasizes the need for flexibility of tactics and a combination of legal and illegal political activity depending on the specific circumstances. As Lenin writes, and this is another good quote, do I have it here? Yes. Um, anyone who is out to think up for the workers some kind of recipe that will provide them with uh, cut and dried solutions for all contingencies or promises that the policy of the revolutionary proletariat will never come up against difficult or complex situations is simply a charlatan. So yeah, I'm sure you've realized that Lenin doesn't mince, mince words in this book or many of his other books. In chapter five, uh, Lenin address, addresses leftist ideas that confuse the leaders, the party, the class and the masses. 
These ideas have much in common with anti-authority principles in anarchist thought. However, Lenin is not challenging anarchists, but a leftist split in the newly formed Communist Party of Germany. He quotes the splitters pamphlet, which says, two communist parties are now arrayed against them, each other. One is a party of leaders, which is out to organize the revolutionary struggle and to direct it from above. And then, you know, there's, I'm not quoting the whole thing, but the other is a mass party, which expects an upsurge of the revolutionary struggle from below. Lenin goes on to describe in detail the definitions of the masses, classes, political parties, and leaders to cut through obfuscation. It is still common today to find views on the ultra left that are anti-communist in the form of being anti-political party. This includes a great many anarchist tendencies as well as uh, Trotskyists who insist on creating a dichotomy between socialism from above, which happens to include all existing socialist societies and their own pure brand of socialism from below, which conveniently has never existed. Lenin makes it clear that political parties can never be divorced from their class character. Leaders of those parties represent class interests as well. And this is a Lenin quote that's here. The mere presentation of the question, dictatorship of the party or dictatorship of the class, dictatorship of the leaders or dictatorship of the masses testifies uh, to most incredibly and hopelessly uh, muddled thinking. These people want to invent something quite out of the ordinary and in their effort to be clever, make themselves ridiculous. Classes are led by political parties. The political parties in as a general rule are run by more or less stable groups composed of the most authoritative, influential and experienced members who are elected to the most responsible positions are called leaders. All this is elementary. All this is clear and simple. Apparently not. Lenin goes on to focus on anti-leadership ideas. He notes that Marx and Engels denounced leaders from the labor aristocracy and that it is now necessary to denounce the leadership of the Second International, that's the, what became the Social Democratic International. Uh, the problem is not denouncing specific leaders worthy of denunciation, but to denounce all leaders. An absolute anti-leadership orientation in the labor movement is sometimes called rank and fileism today. Lenin outlines the need to denounce treacherous leadership while not falling into anarchism. And then here we've got another quote. The opportunist parties have become separated from the masses, i.e. from the broadest, broadest strata of the working people, their majority, the lowest paid workers, the revolutionary proletariat cannot be victor victorious unless this evil is combated, unless this opportunist social traitor leaders are exposed, discredited and expelled. That is the policy of the third international has embarked on. So he's not very keen on the social trader leaders, not going soft on them. But to go so far in this connection as to contrast in general, the dictatorship of the masses with the dictatorship of the leaders is ridiculously absurd and stupid. What is particularly amusing is that in fact, instead of the old leaders who hold generally accepted views on simple matters, new leaders are brought forth under the cover of slogan, down with the leaders who talk rank stuff and nonsense. Lenin's last paragraph here is reminiscent of the joke that arose during the Occupy movement in 2011, that the best way to identify the leaders of the Occupy uh, movement was to locate those that proclaim themselves, there are no leaders the loudest. A fetishization of horizontal organizing and structurelessness uh, does not mean that there are no leaders. It just means that there, those leaders are not accountable in any way. These days, spontaneous waves of protest can sometimes be sparked by social media accounts if the right objective conditions are present. People pointed to the Arab Spring in Egypt 10 years ago as a leaderless movement that was organized by social media. However, in these cases, there are still leaders that are running social media accounts. It is a weak, disorganized, and unaccountable leadership, but a leadership nonetheless. The truth is that organizations with a decision-making hierarchy and a clear division of labor are much more accountable, durable, and long-lasting than leaderless movements. Political parties, which have a program or a broad set of policies that are united, that are that are you know, to be united around, are stronger still. Communist parties operate on the Leninist organizational principle of democratic centralism, 
described in the CPC's constitution, our constitution, as combining the maximum democratic discussion and participation of the membership in party life with the self-imposed obligation to carry out majority decisions and execution of these decisions by an elected centralized leadership capable of leading the entire party. Lenin correctly identifies that the split in the Communist Party of Germany has, arise, has arrived at an anti-party position. This leftist ultra-democratic position ultimately serves the capitalist class. If we can leave it at that uh, for tonight uh, and then come back to this, uh, I hope we can agree to, to do the, the next session, but um, maybe we can talk more about that at the next meeting. Thanks so much, comrades. Um, talk to you soon, I guess. Talk to you next week.